Good morning. I'm glad you're able to take some time to devote to worship. I do not have any, any announcements this week, and so we'll jump right in with the reading from the book of uh, Zechariah today. In the eighth month, the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, son of Berechiah, the son of Edo. The Lord was very angry with your forefathers. Therefore, tell the people, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Return to me, declares the Lord, and I will return to you. Do not be like your forefathers to whom the earlier prophets proclaimed. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Turn from your evil ways and your evil practices. But they would not listen or pay attention to me, declares the Lord. Where are your forefathers now? And the prophets, do they live forever? But did not my words and my decrees, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, overtake your forefathers? Then they repented and said, The Lord Almighty has done to us what our ways and practices deserve, just as he determined to do. Before I get into the sermon, a note about water heaters. Last week I used the dealing with your water heater yearly, cleaning it as uh, an example of something that we tend to avoid. And I did not realize that uh, this is something that is recommended for uh, homeowners to do. It is something I found on the list of things homeowners should take care of when I first uh, was responsible for a parsonage over in Buckland. And uh, I, didn't, I thought more people did it, and I evidently not. So uh, yeah. Fascinating little mini unintentional experiment there. Don't know what to make of that. This week, though, we leave Haggai behind and we move on to uh, Zechariah. You see, Haggai had done his job. He is one of the prophets that the people listened to. The prophet Haggai showed up and told the people who had come back from 70 years in exile, he tells them, do it. Build the temple. And they did it. They started building the temple. And so this is a very good thing, right? They, they did what he asked, and so that his job was done. And so we turn the page on Haggai, and the very next book is uh, Zechariah. Haggai's task had been get, to get the people working again. Zechariah's task is different. His task is, to, he is sent by God to tell the people that if they go to God, that God will return to them, that they should learn the lesson of their forefathers, of their grandparents and uh, great-grandparents, and that they need to devote themselves to worship again, devote themselves fully. And so this sets the focus for, for Zechariah. Like, you're going to get the temple done. It's going to take you a few years. And so during the five years during which the people build the temple, Zechariah is chatting with them for two years of it in the middle, uh, helping them prepare to be done with the temple, to, to, to begin to worship in the temple once more. The first half of the book that bears his name is just the visions of Zechariah, the eight visions of them. Now, visions are not something that I am very familiar with, I confess. I can read through them and study the context required to make sense of them, but they are not my strong point. However, they are central to Zechariah, and so we can't gloss over them just because uh, it's not the easiest thing to understand. And so while we could just take a week of vision, I, I don't think we're going to do that. I, th I think we're going to, the approach we'll take is we're going to go over all eight of them today. I'll, I'll give you a, a paraphrase of each vision and give you a few thoughts about each one. And then at the end, we'll be able to look at all eight of them together and see, uh, is there a theme there? Is there something that, that is being uh, gotten at? <laughs> so the first vision, the paraphrase of it. Zechariah shares with the people that God is looking across creation and they, the report that God receives, the report that God receives about creation is that everything is under control. And in that moment, the vision is, God is asked, are you still angry with Judah? And God's answer is, I am angry with the other nations who have acted in arrogance, but now is the time for me to care for Judah to tell the people of Judah that prosperity will come once more. This would have been welcome news for people that had been in a rough spot for the last two generations. Very, just a good thing to hear that God is for them. 
the second vision, a paraphrase of it. The prophet looked and saw four horns and asked, what are these? And then a messenger, an angel, told him that these are the horns that have scattered the people away from the promised land. And then the prophet saw four blacksmiths and asked again, what are these? And the messenger, the angel, told him that they are here to strike down the horns. This is an example of how we, we can kind of intuit how visions might work, how, how this might come across. Like Something like this, it might be that Zechariah, who is there where the temple is being built, would have seen uh, draft animals pulling things with horns on their heads, right? And so he sees uh, four horns, and, um, and he gets a nudge, uh, a message, an angel. An angel literally means messenger. Uh, that there's more going on here than those are just oxen pulling a load. That those horns, horns in scripture, if they're used symbolically, a horn is understood to represent an empire or the ruler of an empire. And so it represents the empires that have caused so much problem, so many problems for, for Judah and its capital, Jerusalem. And so he sees the four horns, and right after the four horns come four blacksmiths again. It would have been a common thing to see uh, on, a, on a site where people, a temple is being built metalsmiths right and so uh, and then he gets again again this nudge ah those horns will not stand that uh, these metalsmiths these blacksmiths are there to pound down these horns and and no longer do you need to un uh, fear the empires that have caused such great problems before the third vision the prophet sees a surveyor and the angel tells the prophet that the city that is being built is going to be so full that it will overflow the walls that the surveyor is laying out. And that the people of this city will be protected by more than just a wall, but by uh, the Lord their God. Again, uh, this vision, it, it would have been common for, for someone to see surveyors. You would have had surveyors around the capital as the temple was being rebuilt. And, and maybe the prophet sees a surveyor, and the angel tells him that there is more going on here, that this surveyor is going to lay out walls around the temple, but the, wall, the, 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 uh, the city is going to grow far beyond those walls, and uh, this would be good news to the Jewish people who are having a hard time believing anything can go their way. The fourth vision, uh, Joshua, the high priest who had rebuilt the offer, altar, um, was overseeing the progress of the te temple. He, he stands before the Lord and Satan is there accusing him, for that is his role. The Satan means the accuser. And then God spoke to them, declaring that I will save Jerusalem. Then the angel spoke to the high priest, declaring that his dirty clothing would be taken away and exchanged for clean, that his sin had been cleansed in doing this. And finally, the high priest is charged to stay focused on God and to look for the coming leader from the line of David. So I have no clue what to make of this vision, and there's no like easy way to say, ah, oh, well, maybe he saw a metalsmith walking down the road. Like, I don't know what to make of this. Maybe he saw, he saw the, the high priest leading worship, and he sees that there's more at play there. I, I don't know, right? I don't fully understand this. But to hear that in the midst of such a great task that uh, Joshua, the high priest, that, that they're lead, being led by a leader that can be trusted, that even when this leader is accused by the the ultimate accuser that he can be trusted and he his sin has been washed away and he will be faithfully looking for the leader who will come after them that would have been very reassuring for people who needed to trust their leaders in this tense and challenging time the fifth vision the prophet woke out of a deep slumber and the angel asked him what he saw he saw a lampstand of gold with seven sprouts. Further, there was a bowl with an olive tree on either side. What does this mean, the prophet inquired. The angel told Zechariah that this is the message of the Lord for Zerubbabel, that the temple will be finished, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, the spirit of God. That the last stone of the temple will be put in place. And so do not despair, nor question the day of small beginnings. The angel that explains that the seven lamps is a reference to God seeing all things, seven being the number of completion of all, and a lamp being used what you see. And then the olive trees are the source of the oil used in worship. 
as the people continue to work. The building of the temple took five years. Being reminded that what would have been started was going to be completed, that would have been essential. And so for this vision to be shared with the people, to, for them to be told that they should not despise the day of small beginnings, that they were building something great and grand and amazing, and it all began with one stone being laid. Right, that, that is a powerful thing to hear. For some reason, I... Uh, the, we hear the phrase, a, a journey of a thousand miles begins with one step, and that's true. Somehow this feels a little bit more grand, and it gets at something. Do not despise the day of small beginnings. And that's what they have done. They made a small beginning, and God is using it with them and through them to build something grand. The sixth vision. The prophet looked up and saw a book flying. And the angel asked, what do you see? And Zechariah responded, I see a book that is 30 foot wide and 15 foot long. The angel explained, this is an indictment of all of those who have lied and stolen. And it will be the downfall of those who have committed this sin. Their houses shall fall. Well, this is a bit odd. The best we can make of this is that this is a very large book or a very large scroll because it took that big of a document to list all of the people who had lied or stolen. And that even in this time when uh, God is with the people and guiding them and helping them, that it does not mean that sin goes unpunished, right? That this is the sense that sin is self-punishing, that if you cheat and lie and steal, that you will cause the downfall of your own house. This admittedly is one of the more challenging visions to get our minds around. This and the next one, the seventh vision. In the seventh vision, the angel, the messenger, asked the prophet to look up, and Zechariah sees a basket flying by, and in the basket was a person. The messenger says that this person is the sin of all of the people, and then the basket flies off to the east, to Shinar, is what it we're called, told, is where it's headed. Well, Shinar is an ancient term for Babylon. And it was understood by the Jewish people that the temptation they had, that they had yielded to was the temptation that had come from the east, from Babylon, and that this temptation to, that they yielded to and that had caused their downfall was the sin of idolatry and the sin of worshiping other gods. And, and idolatry was understood uh, to be a form of infidelity. It's not just that they worshiped other gods, it's that like they were sleeping around on their god. They had made this covenant to I will be your God and you will be my people and they have this covenant and this marriage and they are now so they're going to other gods and uh, the, the temptation to do so that they had yielded to the person in the basket is a woman and the temptation to sleep around is it's problematic for a whole slew of reasons but the temptation to worship other gods and to sort of sleep around is presented as a woman uh, it, it's Yes, and if it sounds like I'm dancing around the topic, that really is what I am doing. But this is a representation of the harlotry of Babylon and how that is being sent back to the east from whence it came. And it, will, it is being cast from the people. So no more shall the people be tempted into this idolatry and the sleeping around with other, other gods. And we should call back to fidelity to the Lord their God. <clears throat> The eighth vision, the prophet saw four chariots coming forth from the two mountains of bronze, and the horses of each chariot were red and then black and then white and then dappled. The prophet, prophet asked what was going on, and the prophet was told that these are the four winds sent by the Lord, the master of the earth, that they went north and then south. They had gone to survey the, lo the land, and they had found peace from the north. This is the last vision and is responding to a fear that the people had harbored all along. Whenever Jerusalem had been invaded in recent history, for centuries really, it had come from the north. The, the eastern empires of Assyria and Babylon would come over and then they would come down south to, into Jerusalem, into Judah. And so no longer do they need to fear the invasion. No longer do they need, need to worry that the, the cloud on the horizon in the north is anything other than a storm that is not the scout party of an invading army. If you think about, take a moment and think about all the things that people would have been worried about in this moment. 
Right? They have come back out of exile. They're rebuilding the temple. They've, they've stepped forward. They're going to do it. They're, they're just taking care of it, right? They, Haggai has told them they need to do it, and they're doing it. But think about all the things they would have been worried about. And it struck me as I was going through these visions that these are the answers. These are the responses to the worries of a people who have come out of exile. Right? Is God angry with us? The first vision tells them, no, God is with you. Is this just going to happen again? No. The second vision tells them that empires that were going, that could have done this have been shattered. Can this city ever prosper again? Yes, the third vision tells them. This city will grow. It will grow beyond the walls that you build because you don't understand how much it will thrive. Can we trust the leaders of this in the church? The leaders had fought, led us astray and such that we had gone into exile in the first place. They have failed us. And can we trust them? Yes, Joshua can be trusted. And he will look towards the leader from the line of David who will follow him. Can we really do this? The next vision reminds them, you can and you will. Do not despise the day of small beginnings. You made a small beginning and it's turning into something amazing. Now, does this mean that anything goes now? Like we've come back from exile and now everything's going to just, everyone can just do whatever they want because God's just going to love us all? Uh, you know, there are still consequences. If you sin or you, if you are a liar or a thief, your house is still going to get knocked down from the results of your, your, your sin. Aren't we just going to fall into the same trap again? No, the temptation from Babylon has been cast back to the east. Do I need to live in fear? The fear that there will be another invasion? No. The last vision reminds them, tells them this. There is peace from the north. You do not need to live in fear. This is not something that was clear to me. Like I, I looked at each of the visions and kind of worked through what, how I kind of understood each of them. And I, I, it wasn't until I got to the end of typing it all in, after spending all week working with it, that I realized what this was. This is the roll call of the fear of a people. And these visions are God's responses to response to those fears given to the people such that they might continue to do what Haggai has told them that they, that they need to do. Just do it. Okay, we're still afraid. Well, let me, let me respond to your fears. Let me respond to your worries. Right? Just keep on doing what you know you need to do and trust that your God is involved and do not worry about this and this and this and this. It's just, just, just trust. And do what you know God desires you to be doing. And I don't think that's a bad thing for us to be hearing today. To take all of our worries, all of them, there's a bunch, aren't there? Put them before God and trust that following God, doing what God desires, seeking God's dreams, that's what we can do. Do not let the worries overcome us. Do not despise the day of small beginnings. We make our small beginning today of living a life being faithful to Jesus. And we trust that God is building something grand and vast and important out of it. Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you to bow your heads and join with me in prayer. Lord, in a time when worries threaten to overwhelm, when there is so much that we might be concerned about, help us hear your servant Zechariah and the visions you give him. We may not understand how the visions work, but we do understand that you are for us, and this is good news for us. And so let our worries subside and help us to have a peace that we do not understand, but we need deeply. Help us to, like the Jewish people who are building your temple, help us to have a confidence that your will is going to be done and that we can focus on what we need to do and what we can do, what we can do today. We thank you for all these things. In the name, as we pray in the name of your Son and our Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you this day and always. Amen.